has been our own personal quest to find out about Karen Logan. Uh, Lewis graduated from St. Thomas High School at Rice University. He's utterly brilliant, and he's going to tell you about Camp Logan today. Thank you. Well, I hope I can live up to that. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, Camp Logan in the sense of uh, the stories that came from the soldiers, and we'll see why. You know, uh, one of the things about doing history is you often go right straight to the government documents and so forth, and they're pretty boring. But uh, as we get into this story, we'll see that the real story of the camp came from the soldiers who uh, worked there. So we'll let's begin uh, the story on April 6, 1917. And that's the time when the United States entered uh, World War I. They declared war on Germany. And uh, then they realized that they only had 300,000 active soldiers in the military. And they felt they needed a two million man army for the American Expeditionary Force. And so uh, uh, to do that, Congress instituted the draft. Do you remember the draft? <laughs> you guys aren't draft. Well, not all of you are draft days. I was draft days. And, uh, and uh, then they also activated the National Guardians of several states, as well as they had a very intensive program to encourage enlistments. So by the uh, end of the spring, they had established, or at least uh, intended to establish 45 new training camps to build this army. And of those 45, 32 were to uh, uh, train the United States Army. And of those 32, 16 were to train the activated National Guard units. And Houston was awarded one of those training camps, and it was for a National Guard unit, and it was called Camp Logan. Does anybody know where the name Camp Logan comes from? This man right there. Yes, sir. It was named after John A. Logan, who was a Civil War general from Illinois in 1826. Exactly. And this is one of our docents, too, so please. <laughs> Ask him any question. My entire marriage license was uh, done in the courthouse in Murfreesboro, Illinois, where, where Logan's birthplace is. So I went to his house. That's, that's great because I had never heard of John A. Logan. And usually when I ask that question, we get silence. But when I find somebody from Illinois, I usually ask them to sing the state. <laughs> because that's one of the only state songs that actually has Logan's name in it, along with, uh, I think, the way those, he did those it. two other guys. Two other guys. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. By the way, yeah. he yeah. was born in Illinois. Yeah. Lincoln wasn't. So. Right. Right. He's in the Anyway, he was so revered that when, when the Illinois National Guard was coming, they said, "Well, this should be named Camp Logan." just to uh, prevent any confusion. So Camp Logan uh, was built about five miles out of town. You know, Houston was a very small city in 1917. It had about 120,000 uh, population, 120,000 people. And they built this camp out in the farmland the west of town. But today, as you can see from this layout, this is, oh, I don't have a pointer. You can see the outline of the, the uh, camp at the triangle put over uh, Memorial Park because the main uh, camp of, the, uh, of Camp Logan was essentially over Memorial Park. You can see that footprint. And of course, you have 610 and 910 and both of But that was only the camp where the guys lived. A lot of the other activities occurred in the other portions of the camp, which were the rifle range. It might be hard to see, but it's right here. That's roughly just near to a little bit before you get to maybe that's Britmore, before you get to Beltway 8. That was the rifle range for the camp. And then a little farther out, right over here, you can see coming from the bayou up into what is today Annex Reservoir was the artillery range. 
So they had this main camp, which is about 3,000 acres, and then when you add them all together, it totals about 9,500 acres of the land that uh, uh, was part of Camp Logan. So this is a map of the, uh, the layout of the camp, and actually it's a very interesting uh, a map because it was drawn by one of the soldiers who was at the camp. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But he drew, when he, while he was there, during uh, September until he left about uh, May, he uh, created this map. He was a draftsman, and so he paced off the map. It is actually very close to scale, even though he had no, no real sophisticated tools, but he paced it off and drew this map. And the, the best part about it is, and we'll look at it a little closely, but you can see all the annotations. We know exactly which units were which <coughs> regimental unit on this camp. This is a very important historical detail that you won't find in write-ups of many of the other camps, only because he did this and uh, was a tremendous uh, historical record. And so I will take a look here at some of the features other than the the, uh, the layout of the where the, the soldiers were staying. We have in this this uh, camp area extended down below Buffalo Bayou. This is Buffalo Bayou going across here. There were two drill fields down below. Uh, River Oaks did not exist at this time. This was all farmland, so uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, it's an interesting thing. Most people are unaware of the... Let me tell you a story about that. So we were doing this talk for the DAR one time, and we, Lewis put this slide up and said, showed where the Remont area was of the camp, and that Buffalo Bayou, and that Camp Logan actually was on what is now River Oaks. And I swear to you, this woman in the audience put her hand over her heart and said, oh, surely not. <laughs> not in River Oaks. And by the time we finished with the presentation, she went home and had her gardener dig up her yard to see if there was anything. <laughs> <laughs> Another feature is the remount area. The remount was a, uh, a, the uh, horse supply, you know, they had to uh, replenish uh, horses if they got sick or something. And that was up on the northwest side of the camp. And then we're going to look at this end where the main entrance is. We'll look at it more closely. But the main entrance is at the apex on the eastern side of this triangle very near uh, the Washington Avenue roundabout, if you're familiar with that. So this is a blow up of the, uh, the uh, main entrance. The camp uh, was under the command of General George Bell, Jr., who's a general serving with the U.S. Army, the regular army in El Paso. His father also was a, a general as well. So he was uh, well attuned to the military. He was assigned the the, to be the commander of the 33rd Division. The Illinois National Guard, when they were activated, were rolled into the new 33rd Division. And as the commander, he was then the commandant, since the 33rd Division was most of the, uh, most of the units at this camp. Uh, one of the uh, things to note is that the main, at the main entrance, they have a lot of uh, buildings that are social service buildings, we call it. You can see the list, YMCA, YWCA, and they're all in here. Look at all the notations. The War Department uh, figured that uh, this, you know, this was the first large mobilization of the uh, United States military since the Civil War. And they felt like they had learned something in the 60 or so years because they, they decided they better take care of the soldiers a little better. And so they hired the YMCA as the prime contractor for all five camps to take care of uh, the social, uh, recreational, and religious needs of the soldiers on the camp. So let's go ahead into the camp. The main camp gate looks like this, but if you're real, Oh, this is camp on gate number two. <coughs> this is actually the, the gate that was at Blossom Street, if you're familiar with 
uh, the neighborhood there. Blossom Street's about four blocks down from uh, uh, the roundabout. I also want to point out that uh, if you look in here, the camp is sparsely wooded. It wasn't a heavily wooded area at the time of the camp. Uh, there was a lot of discussion during the, the drought we had about uh, five years ago and all the trees dying and the heavy forest was ruined. Well, the heavy forest was new. Uh, it didn't really look like that in, uh, in this period of time. So uh, this is a point of interest. So this is a, an example of the YMCA's, uh, one of their eight facilities. And uh, one of the major things that the War Department and the YMCA promoted was they wanted the soldiers to stay connected. You know, they're all from way out from uh, home, you know, all the way from Illinois. It seemed like their, their method was they sent you as far away from your hometown as they could. And uh, so anyway, they uh, had this great program where they would, they encouraged writing letters back home. And uh, in fact, they had these commercial uh, photographic companies come into the camp and take pictures of various activities of the camp, and then you could buy the postcards with the nice picture. And so uh, we have used three archives of soldiers who served at Camp Logan as the basis for the story, one of which is that of Paul Hendrickson up here. He's in with the 33rd Division. He was from Danville, Illinois, the draftsman who drew the map. Uh, you go 125 letters back home. And they're not just, hi, mom, things are great. He wrote extensive letters about the activities that he were, they were undergoing. The second one is a one from a, a gentleman who was not in the 33rd Division. He was in the 78th Field Artillery of the 6th Division. But they had extra space at the camp, so they sent some of these over. But Clark Brewster was from uh, rural New York State, uh, about 100 miles uh, actually south of Scranton, right on the Pennsylvania border. And then William Bragg of the 30, 370th. He was the chaplain of the 370th Infantry, an all African American unit from the city of Chicago. Uh, he was also the pastor of the Baptist Church. And so uh, when the guys got the uh, activated, he decided to come along, and he wrote the letters back home uh, to the, to the uh, families to let them, them know what the, children, the kids were doing. The Knights of Columbus decided that they would like to help participate uh, for the non-Protestant members of the thing, so they were a subcontractor with the uh, YMCA, and they had a large facility in the western end of the, uh, the camp and also the Jewish Welfare Center was established for the Jewish community. Now we have the YWCA built hostess houses for all of these camps to have dignified places for the soldiers to meet with their wives or girlfriends. Uh, Red Cross had a convalescent hospital. The American Library Association established a library. Uh, uh, the American uh, Library Association recruited some very top-notch people. The gentleman who came to Camp Logan was the director of the Denver Public Library. He uh, oversaw the construction of this building and with a few volunteer soldiers was able to catalog 10,000 books to circulate among the soldiers. What a remarkable event. This was the post office where all those cards and letters went out of, and there was also a base hospital in the area. Now, we want to look at the, uh, the, the <coughs> truth strength in the camp. It's uh, got an interesting thing. The uh, camp itself was accepted by General uh, George, uh, George Bell on uh, August 30th. He uh, wired the, the War Department to start sending soldiers so you can see they start showing up in September, but by November, they're about full strength. This is the first wave of activity. In fact, this is the wave that we have the most information about. Uh, you can see that it drops off by June, because by that time, they were being shipped over to France, and then they started the second wave. 
And so uh, the uh, troops came on the train. They arrived at Eureka Station. And uh, the uh, Paul Hendrickson uh, on the first day brought back to his mom. September 17, 1917, dear mom. Well, we were at Camp Rogan. I have just taken a shower bath and guarded the supply tank for an hour or so, and I will tell you what I can. It is awfully dusty here. Our camp is out in the light woods north of Houston, three or four miles. We got in here this morning at 9 a.m. and have been busy as can be all day. Nearly all the 5th Regiment is here. I don't know how many other regiments are here, too. The camp looks like a regular city. The streets are numbered, and some are fresh rock but the ground is like rock almost, just a regular dried out woods. We are in our tents. We have an electric light in our tent. Wired today. Kitchen and mess hall is built and each company has a mess hall. There are lots of buildings for different purchase purposes. The railroad comes right out here. Things in general look very dry here. In the street where the dirt was graded into a street, the dust is six or eight inches thick. This will certainly be a rotten place if it ever rains. <laughs> First day in Houston, we already figured that out. So this is a typical uh, regimental unit. You can see the officers row along the front, a road between the officers and the company buildings, and then the vast array of uh, tent for the soldiers behind that. This happens to have a uh, hospital for a clinic structure. And then behind that, you can't see, but you, from this side you can, you have a bathhouse, and they have latrines, and then behind that they had uh, the uh, corrals for the horses. So we're going to take a look at the uh, three legs of this triangle to get an idea of which units were here. We're looking at the northwest leg, and it's primarily the 108th engineers plus three field artillery units. Now, the 108th Engineers were uh, one of the larger uh, regiments here. They were uh, builders, and so they would uh, uh, practice uh, the field activities by building bridges across the gullies in the park and repairing some of the buildings that didn't quite uh, fit what they wanted from the contractor. Within their unit, they had uh, one of the, these uh, base exchanges or regimental exchanges each regiment actually had one, and these were, were uh, cooperatives that the soldiers uh, would uh, put money into, and then they would buy toiletries, soda water, uh, just things of that nature that they could buy on base without going off base. But within the uh, 108th, they also had a uh, motor vehicle ambulance corps, and the Motor Truck Division. They were embedded within the 108th Engineers for a good reason. Automobiles and motorized vehicles were fairly new, and the engineers could probably keep them running. They all, you know, there were other units that had horse-drawn uh, uh, material carriers. This is a, a, a classic example of a field artillery unit named the 123rd. They look like ordinary soldiers. But on the uh, artillery field, you can see up here that, uh, you think about it, that looks very much like the Civil War picture. In particular, the uh, carriages of the large spoke wheels. And that's because the artillery was not automated. It was built to be transported by horses and mules. We get this transition phase in uh, the World War I where we're coming out of 19th century warfare and moving into 20th century warfare. And we'll see more of that. As we go along the western leg of this triangle, it's primarily these uh, infantry units plus some machine gun battalions down here at the bottom. Then the first unit up there was the 370th. As I mentioned, they were out of the Illinois National Guard. They were called the 8th uh, uh, Infantry of the Illinois National Guard. But when they uh, were activated, they were assigned to the 93rd Division instead of the 33rd Division because the U.S. Army was segregated at this time. 
So they had to establish a division for African American soldiers, and they were assigned to that division. This is an interesting photo. Uh, uh, they're in parade. They participated just like all of the soldiers at the camps, where they would uh, have patriotic parades through the city. So they're marching into downtown. The interesting thing about this photo is this is Wa Drive at Washington Avenue. Uh, it looks a little different today. <laughs> This is a picture of Paul Hendrickson. He was in the uh, in, in the uh, 129th uh, uh, 129th Infantry, but he's the guy who uh, wrote all of those uh, wonderful letters. And then, if you look at the bottom row, this is along the south side again. It's upside down, I know. But the, you have some more infantry units and the uh, fifth division and the sixth division units and hospital corps. Uh, so I want to point out the, uh, this photo of the 79th Infantry. We don't have one of the 78th, but I guarantee you, Paul, uh, I mean, Clark Brewster's 78th Infantry looked just like this. The important thing about this photo is it's a cavalry unit. In World War I, the rule of thumb was one horse for three soldiers. By December, there were 34,000 plus soldiers at Camp Logan. How many horses do you think were there? Over 10,000. Now, Camp Logan would have been crowded with 34,000 soldiers, but you had 10,000 horses. You can imagine uh, what it was like. But in the, uh, this period of time, <coughs> horsemanship was a main fact of life in the Army. And Clark Brewster uh, spent a lot of time working with the horses. January 20th, 1918, dear Dad, we have been getting new horses in for the last several days and now have about 150. The new ones are all big, heavy horses, and they are in good shape. We all will have some grooming to do now, but I think the battalion command will get their horses next week, and then we'll have to look over after theirs, too. Yesterday morning, all the officers of non-coms had to go to Houston and listen to a lecture by an English lieutenant colonel. Everybody went mounted, so a bunch of privates had to go along to watch the horses. Well, I had a saddle, so I had to go. We left here at 8 o'clock and got down there about 9.30. We went through the city and dismounted on the edge. Another fellow and I tied the horses to where we were holding in a circle and went uptown. When we got back, the horses were just as we left them. We arrived back in camp at one o'clock, so you can see I had quite a day of it. The horses didn't like the streetcars, and once mine went up on the sidewalk with me, but I soon put it in line again. We went about 10 or 12 miles, the weather was beautiful, and I sure enjoyed it. The very next day, January 21st, 1918. Last night it rained and snowed, <laughs> and this morning it was fierce out. When the ice and snow started to melt, it sure made some mud. The whole battery had to go for horse exercise, and we had quite a ride. Done quite a lot of trotting, and I like it with my saddle. When we got back, it sure was some job grooming the horses, for they were all mud. We all had to groom three horses apiece, and that was no sin. <laughs> of course, the uh, I promoted the, uh, the uh, cavalry as a, a feature. The horse's man's noblest companion. That's the army. <laughs> but they had this huge remount area, 58 buildings, 400 soldiers manning it, veterinary hospital. They had to continue to keep the uh, army supply of horses. But this was a good picture of the corrals and so forth. There were about 1,500 horses just in the remount area. I'm going to take a quick look at the officer's row, typical. Uh, uh, tent work there. And then these are the tents that the uh, soldiers use. Now they're kind of interesting. They're not such ordinary tents. They've got uh, nice wooden walls. There are about six to eight soldiers per uh, tent. Uh, the uh, tents were wired, as Paul had mentioned the first day. They were wired. You can see the wires at the top. Uh, they had a little light bulb right by his, his table. And we also had an iPhone outlet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a different story. But anyway, it was, uh, 
relatively comfortable for these guys. In, the, uh, in front of the uh, tents were the company buildings, four companies per regiment, uh, two buildings per uh, company. So you had about eight, sometimes 10 buildings per regiment. They were just lined up. There were over 1,300 buildings, wooden buildings, at Camp Logan. They also had these exotic uh, sanitary latrines later in the, uh, the uh, uh, period of the camp. They were not there with the first group, but they were built in, in 1918, as we found out. The important part about these are, these are not pier and beam, but they're on concrete uh, slabs. Keep that in mind, it'll make a, an interesting story later on. Again, the shower bags, the same way, concrete structure. Uh, they also had a, a large field baking facility, 14 bake ovens, running eight shifts a day, 24,000 pounds of bread on average every day, out of a field uh, oven. They also had a bakers and cook school. There was, there were nine of these, these uh, schools in those 45 camps, and Camp Logan was lucky enough to get one of them. And, uh, you know, you had to train the cooks for that two million man army. But what they really came for was their regular training, company drill, uh, my favorite, the uh, company inspection. Paul Hendrickson had a great discussion of this. But the key was, we got out there at 7 in the morning and didn't get back until 4.30. If you've been in the Army, you know that's pretty typical. You had to also learn about uh, your, your weapon that you're going to be using, with, and then did rifle inspection. Every regiment had a band. Uh, you saw the band in that earlier picture. It helped you march. But also, uh, the band used to entertain the troops in the evening when they're off out they volunteered to do that. Around the camp, they also had trench areas where they practiced various uh, uh, activities related to trench warfare. Trench warfare was not new in World War I, but it had a very interesting and diabolical new aspect to war, which was the poison gas. So they had to learn uh, about uh, warfare with poison gas. The, uh, uh, the Army de developed for these soldiers not only those small trench areas, but a complete replica of the French lines. You can see on this map, this is a eight, 1944 area survey, and you can see the <coughs> area of the, uh, the, the trench warfare area still there in 1944, thanks to, to Mike over here from Grady, he found that out. Now, this was located between, uh, it's cut off here, but that's Post Oak Road and uh, Hempstead Highway, and that's Loop 610. You can see it lying right in there. This, Paul Hendrickson uh, writes a wonderful story, many pages <coughs> in his letter, about a week that he spent in the trench warfare unit. Read it, it's uh, tremendously interesting. Military aviation begins in World War I. We're, we're seeing the trend again away from 19th to 20th century warfare. These guys probably did not see airplanes a lot. And so uh, when the, the aircraft would fly up from Ellington Field, they were quite interesting. February 15, 1918. An airplane came down on our drill grounds the other day. I and Sergeant Henderson ran over to where it was. The companies kept drilling, so we had no one crowding around, and we got a very good look at up close at it. First time I was ever so close to one. I was about 20 feet from it when it left the ground. It did not run the ground a length of the lot until the wheels and all were clear of the ground by a quarter more. Joe, they are the most graceful things I ever saw, and so many of them flying around here all the time. <laughs> we showed that first picture uh, to the uh, Liberty County Historical Commission. Afterwards, a gentleman came up and said, you know, they did have real aircraft, you know. <laughs> <laughs> His wife's grandfather 
who's pictured in this picture with a, a Jenny, the Haviland Jenny aircraft that he uh, said, I want you to put that in so people don't think they were just those flimsy little trains. <laughs> they also went out to the uh, rifle range. They would spend a week, you know, you march out, spend a week firing on the rifle range. It's a good picture of the uh, trench that the soldiers fired at. Uh, Paul Hendrickson actually sketched the whole uh, rifle range trench area, four trenches, and a uh, carved trench. They uh, also spent a lot of time uh, with artillery training at the artillery range. This is a good display of why they needed horses and how they uh, had to handle the carriages with the large wheels and so forth. This is sort of a, a, a formational type of thing also had howitzer training in the area. Now, after they were finished with their day's work, the Army wanted to make sure they had things to do. So the uh, YMCA handled the athletic program. They had uh, baseball leagues, football leagues, track and field meets, boxing, soccer leagues, no less, and various activities where the soldiers could uh, relaxed, but they felt that athletics provided this sense of training for teamwork and uh, physical fitness. So you also saw things like basketball goals at every company, and also uh, the Liberty Theater was provided for non-athletic entertainment. Every night of the week there was a program, musical program, lecture, and so forth. It was also time uh, away from work, as you can see. It says, I'm always ready for a frolic. <laughs> and Kent Logan will go on beyond that. Visitation Day was a big event, and they would wives would come and, uh, and uh, dance in high heels on grass. But in reality, they were being trained to go overseas. You can see this is a stock picture. It's not Kent Logan's troops, but it's what all of them went through shipping out of New Jersey, going over to France. The first group to go was the 370th. Beginning in March and going through about April, they were shipped up to New Jersey, got on the boats, were in uh, France by May, and they met with uh, uh, General Blackjack Pershing, who said, uh, we have our segregated army, uh, you will be assigned to the French army. And they weren't too happy about that. They wanted to go to fight for freedom, but they got over it. And by the middle of the summer, they were on the front, front lines. You can see from this uh, slide that uh, 71 of these gentlemen were awarded the Croix de Guerre. 21 were awarded Distinguished Service Crosses. These were only 200 and about 2,200 men, 2,200 men, and nearly 100 of them had received high, at least high battlefield honors. My favorite is Private Arthur Johnson. You can see right here, he won one of each, so he was quite an interesting fellow. The uh, 33rd Division started moving out in April and May, and by June they're in France. By the end of the summer, they're in the Meuse Argonne Offensive, which is the last offense, major offensive of the war. Nine members of the 33rd Division were awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. These names were not known to anybody in Texas until we dug it out. But we did uh, contact the National Guard Museum in Illinois, and they were very helpful. They were very pleased that we were highlighting the soldiers from the Illinois National Guard. And, uh, so we were able to get names, and in the book we tried to also show their faces, names and faces. Fortunately, the U.S. only had to fight for about six months, November 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock in the morning. The armistice went into effect and the war kind of started shutting down. Immediately, the Army uh, began to uh, deactivate the camps, like Camp Logan, by March 20th, 1919, it's closed. They auctioned off the old buildings that they could get rid of, they auctioned off the horses and mules that were left, and cleared out everything except the base hospital, 
which operated until 1923, at which point uh, a Chronicle writer wrote a story about this field that's empty today, but used to be full of the soldiers fighting in the war, and we ought to do something about it. Maybe have a little park. Well, a lady, a local lady named Catherine Emmett, read that article and started saying, yes, we need to build a little park to commemorate the soldiers. Well, in one of those talks that she gave was Miss Ima Hogg. And Miss Ima uh, got with her brother Will and Mike and said, we ought to do something. Well, you know, Will Hogg never did anything but small. He said, we have 800 acres of that camp and we can buy the 700 from the Ryan and Land Company. We just put that together as a park and give it to the city of cost. And so the, the city was uh, given Memorial Park. There's a proviso there. It always had to be Memorial Park. And it always had to be a park dedicated to the soldiers. And any changes in the, the uh, focus, you might say, uh, it would revert back to the hall. So that's your story in itself. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, we've done some research. Did you, did you find anything about, was it just trust of the city that they would have a lake, the city would give them $1,000 for the land, because the city did pay $11,000. Right. There are 11 deeds to right. that property. So do we know why it was drug out? Was this just the money the city could come up with? Well, you know, the, the Hall family actually paid the interest for about a year on the but each one of those deeds, and it may be just, I don't know the answer mm -hmm. specifically, but you know, each one of the deeds has that reversion clause in it. Yeah, Mr. Fichtis, I know his right. grandson wrote all of that. Right, so, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was something that was probably uh, tough for the city to take financially, but yeah. the Hogg family wanted them to have it, and of course, and, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> they talk about that too. <coughs> Now, for years, we didn't realize that in the wooded areas of the park, there were ruins of the camp. You can see in this picture uh, some of the foundation ruins of the bathhouses and latrines. All the other buildings were uh, wooden uh, here in Maine. Lots of foundation, uh, sewage line uh, things, some trenches, uh, boiler foundations other uh, bathhouse uh, foundations and so forth. They were all in the forest, known, I think, only to the metal detectors, unfortunately, because in the 1970s and 80s, it was heavily metal detected. But we uh, were told about these, and we went out and found them, and, and there's the uh, uh, sewage treatment facility. We uh, were, uh, thought we're both in the, uh, Texas Historical Commission's Archaeological Stewards Network, which means we work with the uh, Historical Commission. And our archaeologist was in town one day, and he, we said, uh, have you seen the ruins of Camp Logan? And his response was, uh, what's that? So we took him out and showed him the ruins. And as he left town, he said, send me the photos and a map of these ruins and uh, the next THC meeting. It was designated a state art, an antiquity uh, landmark. These are the areas that we initially identified where the ruins were. Uh, the Indian faith uh, expanded that immensely with their work, so uh, it's a little more than that. Uh, but at least we do have the protection. And we've worked with the, uh, the Conservancy on the Master Plan, and they're going to especially work on, on the western side of the, uh, the camp where these foundation rooms are. Hopefully we'll, we'll get them to work with some of those down below. And so that kind of brings you up to date. This is uh, 2015, but we're, we're still working over there and uh, it's a great story and I hope that someday you will go out into the park and, and look at the exhibits that they did. And may I, I want to introduce Mike when you stand up and Jim Huey, stand up and these, this, these are these are archaeologists from Grand Canyon, 
and they are the current archaeologists out at Memorial Park, and they are protecting your park from development. So, and, and they are they are developing the research and the history. And I, I want to show you one thing. You can come over and see it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, they were doing some digging at the Arboretum. Okay, the Arboretum, and they were piling up dirt. And one of the employees at the Arboretum, who happens to be his niece, called us and said, do you know what this is? We just pulled it out of the dirt pile. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a World War I dog tag that is the best dog tag we have ever seen come out of Camp Logan. In fact, we haven't seen any come out of you know, just a couple of metal detectors that pulled it out. Uh, Mike Rinos was able to take this dog tag, immediately found the service record of this man, and he survived the war, he lived in Chicago. So you all are invited to work with us starting on October 12th at the Arboretum where we are going to screen 21 piles of dirt <laughs> that came out of the dump of Camp Road. So what will join us? And Mike, Mike's gonna be here for the rest of the day. You can ask him questions and Jim and we'll be here too. We've taken up more than our time, so. We'll hand it over and answer questions later. Is that okay? Great, okay. Thank you. Recently, 
We have the oldest French colonial shipwreck in the Western Hemisphere. It's not the second. <laughs> we lost our title to Florida. I always feel like we're competing in Florida. Uh, and so of the World War I archaeological sites from the shipbuilding effort, there's about 41 of them in Texas and Louisiana. And I kind of like to claim the ones in Louisiana because they were built here. They were just dumped on the Louisiana side of Spain. Um, I mean, it might be overreach, but there are, there are, you know, like the Texas, right? And these constitute the second largest collection of World War I ship abandonments from the EFC program in the country. The largest is at Malibu Bay, Maryland, and that was recently designated a Marines protected, a Marines, I'm sorry, Marine sanctuary. <clears throat> so because of Allied merchant shipping losses during World War I, the U.S. Shipping Board was established to build a bridge of ships across the ocean to sort of help with our commercial enterprises. But after we entered the war, and this was in April, early April, but on April 16th, 1917, uh, that process of building these ships was really formalized and made part of the war effort. So um, <clears throat> the Emergency Fleet Corporation was designated to build and own and operate this merchant fleet. And one of the first things they did was requisition all of the steel hulled commercial ships that were in construction over a certain time, like the larger ships, for this purpose. But they also created a separate division for building wood and composite ships, because often in wartime, there's a shortage of steel. And so they migrated to making ships of wood, which was sort of at this time a little bit of lost art. So at the time of the conception, there were 24 shipyards able to construct these really, really large ships. But by September, over a year later, in 1918, there were 130 shipyards in operation. And um, they were producing, again, by December, about one steamship a day. And there was a lot of criticism about this because even though there was abundant wood, uh, especially in Texas, a lot of that wood wasn't prepared and ready for construction, so they were building a lot of ships very quickly of green wood. Um, and because they had to get the shipyard workers up to speed uh, with the construction of wooden ships, there was a lag and a delay in, uh, in that construction activity as well. But by 1918, the U.S. is the leading nation for shipbuilding in the world. And this wasn't just in output, this was also in technology. So this, you know, this was sort of an aspect of our merchant marine, and this drive was really made the United States a domineering force in shipbuilding in the world at that time. So this is an image of some of the shipyards, and then there's a, a Gulf district, some of the, the contracts that were created for building these ships. So you have one shipyard that was in Rockport, you had two that were in, I'm trying to think, that's, a, that's a Beaumont, or Orange, sorry. I'm oh, sorry, two in Houston, four in Beaumont, and two in orange. So these are the numbers of contracts that were created for these ships. And, uh, and then we had one that was in Morgan City, uh, Louisiana. And the ones that were in Beaumont were all created specifically at this time for the purpose of building these wooden ships. And I think these are great. These are from the National Archives. These are images, uh, these lower ones, of the vessels that were being built in Texas. So there were 131 that were contracted in the Gulf District. 60 of these were in Orange, so 46%. Uh, so Orange by itself, with those four shipyards, had almost 50% of those construction contracts. And this massive shipbuilding effort in Texas led to deforestation of long-leaf pine, but also a really huge workforce. And I always put little notes for myself in case I forget to say things, but these were the largest wooden ships built at the time. So there are 10 basic types of these emergency fleet corporation vessels. 80% uh, of the contracts were for the sparest type. And I don't know if you guys have seen this from World War I. This is a sort of dazzle pattern that ships were painted to try to make them less noticeable uh, to U boats, that, um, to give them some. More, more of a measure of safety uh, as they were traveling. And so, even though a majority of these were these terrorist class vessels, does this have a laser? Or, no, no, they're a bit pointy. Um, but I thought this was this, the one that you see the third down, the Dovery, which is the, almost the largest of these, 
That particular ship was created, that design, in Orange, Texas, and was predominantly built in the Gulf. And, uh, it, it, so like, so the Ferris class, it took one and a half million linear feet of timber to construct one of those, whereas the Dotary class used about a third of that timber and had more cargo space. And so there was actually a movement to sort of uh, replace this in a way with the Dotary uh, class EFC vessel, but that sort of ended with the armistice in a way. So these are fairly large, uh, about 281 feet, uh, the most common one, the Ferris class vessel. <clears throat> so we had, with the armistice, only 589 vessels are complete or semi-complete of more than these thousands of contracts, and they were a lot of these were offered up for sale, so again, you only had 300 that were in service. Contracts were canceled for the remaining 428. This was over $100 million in contracts. And an issue with these vessels was they were changing the engine, engine type, so they were moving from uh, coal-driven steam engines to internal combustion images, engines. And so you have a wooden ship, which is somewhat of an obsolete shipbuilding design, with now an engine type that's becoming outmoded. And so when they were trying to sell these, there really wasn't a market for these, these millions of dollars worth of vessels. And so they were originally starting to sell them for $75,000. And I don't know if you can see this, but the cost of a wooden cargo ship being built in this program was about $676,000. And so at the time they're offering these up for sale after the armistice, you're already seeing a tremendous reduction in the cost of these vessels. And it's how they're being sold. And this is an ad for the play people. This one from the Galveston Daily News, and it actually breaks up by shipyard the different vessels that were available for sale. And what you see here that says 40 to 100 percent, 50 to 97. So this is the so you have the number of vessels, like there's 12 terrorist vessels here being offered up for sale, and they're from 40 to 100 percent. So these were in different states of construction with the armistice, and they were just sort of selling them in really whatever condition they could get rid of them. And a lot of them, like I know the ones in Beaumont, if not all, a majority of them didn't have, the ones that were being sold, any of their machinery uh, placed on them. So they were really just selling the, the holes themselves. And so, yeah, so you see there were 49 canceled contracts from Texas, 65 vessels in Texas offered for sale. The reason you see these numbers is there doesn't seem to be agreement on how many were sold in Beaumont. But many of these were ultimately abandoned and burned. So the ones in Beaumont, and in fact they were sold and they were resold. So by 1924, these, whether it's 22 or 26 vessels, were sold for $1,000 a piece. So you're talking about a $676,000 vessel that was going to be sold for 75. Uh, there was a contract to buy a bunch of them for 2,000 a piece. That fell through. With and then ultimately they were sold for a thousand dollars each. And so kind of what ends up happening here is they ended up, some of the people who purchased these, some of these groups, they were salvaging the metal off of them, and in doing so they accidentally caught the ships on fire. And there was a lawsuit, because the, the gentleman that bought, I think it was the same group that bought the ships for a thousand dollars, he was going to salvage wood off of it after the iron was removed, and then they ships got on fire, and then he was unable to salvage uh, the wood. So I'm going to roll you through what we have for the archaeology. And I just find this really fascinating because, again, I don't think people realize in Texas, again, we have one of the largest collections of these World War I emergency ship corporation abandonment. And one of them, we, we all probably drive over almost every single day uh, in between the, the Okay, money's been working out. Typically with archaeological sites, you don't tell people where they are because they're protected sites. Um, but some of these are somewhat di like difficult because they're readily visible in historic images. You can see them in Google Earth. And again, there's one at the base of the Icon Bridge that people probably drive past every day. It's a 270 foot long shipwreck. And so to me, that's just fascinating that we have this archaeology here that's relatively unknown. So the Pubble Island shipwrecks these are south of Orange and the Sabine River, and these have, up until recently, received the most archaeological work. So you can see them in these historic aerials from 1957. 
Um, so there's about thir 16 of these that are confirmed. 15 are believed to be these emergency fleet corporation vessels. Uh, these little THC numbers are our shipwreck database numbers. We've assigned them all uh, database numbers. And again, like you'll see, we share parts of them with Louisiana, begrudgingly. <laughs> and these were images that were taken by us. You know, so there was, these were sort of touched on in some reconnaissance <coughs> surveys and some archaeological surveys completed uh, for cultural resource management projects. But the THC went out with the state archaeologist, uh, Chip Agenzi, in 2000 and documented three of the ones that were visible above the waterline. And so this is almost 20 years ago. And we were told recently, Lila and I were told this in a meeting, I think a year and a half ago, that they felt that uh, Hurricane Ike could sort of damage these to the point where they weren't visible anymore. Um, and you can see here, you know, they, they have poured concrete in here in the balance, there is a couple. And um, the one on the upper left is a tub, but the rest of these are the emergency fleet corporation vessels. So the work that was done by the Texas Historical Commission, we believe uh, around 1999, 2000, that there's maybe nine or 10 feet preserved uh, height on these vessels, um, kind of some, like in the water line, but also in the mud. And when I was talking to the Texas General Land Office, it was actually one of their staff that had told us we couldn't see them anymore. And then I was at another meeting with different General Land Office staff, and they're like, oh, no, no, you can still see those. So they have offered to take the CATC out by airboat uh, this winter when it's at lower water so we can do a new assessment of these 16 shipwrecks. I can watch my time because and sometimes I get carried away and I don't want to scoop loud. So lately we've been focusing on the shipwrecks that are in the Natchez River. Because the, the ones in the Pablo Island, they're fairly well known. Uh, they're marked on navigational charts as hazards. They all have archaeological site numbers. Uh, the ones that are in the Natchez River uh, have really had very minimal work completed uh, on the collection. So this is this 1938 historic aerial that's in Google Earth, and we sort of use that and navigational charts to plot the locations of where we think a lot of these shipwrecks are. These are these little shipwreck icons, and you'll have to see anything, do not show you the <laughs> So, but again, this is this information is really just gathered from the historic aerials and from these navigational charts. And there's this pesky little line in our law. When our law was enacted in 1969. There's a line in there that talks about the protection of pre-20th century shipwrecks. So what does that look, you know, when it was acting in 69, that probably didn't seem like a very big deal. And so, but the other thing we say is that archeological sites of every character are protected. And so, since these sites have not been investigated, almost none of these have archeological site numbers. It's a little bit more difficult for us to protect them because of that pre-20th century language that is in our law. I've already been smacked down by law enforcement once when, uh, I don't know, did I say that in the Empire Day, but there was a shipwreck that was being looted from the 1920s, and when I contacted law enforcement, when we finally had confirmation of what it was, they got hung up on that pre-20th century language, and by this time, I had already had a, a data site number, I had nominated it as state indicative landmark, it's our highest protection in the state, but they, law enforcement still got hung up on that pre-20th century language, so I mean, the thing is, is is we can sit at the Texas Historical Commission and try to protect these archaeological sites based on federal and state law, but we're not actually the enforcement end of that. So if law enforcement isn't willing to work with us, there's not a whole lot we can do. So I, I, for some reason, my specialty was actually the first half of the 19th century, but I spent a lot of time trying to protect these 20th century sites because they're a bit more vulnerable. So in the Natchez River, there were archaeological surveys conducted in 1980 and in 2006. So that's the only work that's really been done. And these were ahead of construction projects. And this is what we accomplished uh, just this earlier this month. We, we didn't do a magnetometer survey. We strictly did a sonar survey, trying to see if we could capture acoustic data that would image these shipwrecks on the seafloor. So that's a little over five miles of survey. It was a great two days to just spend laundry up and down the Natchez. And I've now learned it's dangerous to boat on the weekends on the Natchez River. <laughs> a lot of recreational boating up there. So this was the first survey that was conducted, and I'm just going to talk about this a little bit because the there were five shipwrecks that they recorded in 1980, 
And two of them are the circle of other ships. The ones on the upper left are barges. And because the shipwreck had what they were calling diagonal iron bracing, which was an aspect of clipper ship construction and early steamship construction, they theorized that these ships were mid 19th century ships, and they're not. They're, these are World War I shipwrecks. So, but again, and it's interesting because in the report they actually talk about the World War I shipbuilding, but they didn't think the length to beam ratio was correct, and that these wouldn't be associated with World War I. And like right here on this one, you can actually see these Roman numeral draft marks on the ship. And this is uh, pretty much it for the imagery that was presented in that report. Now, in 2006, uh, the, kind of the global research management firm, uh, PBS and J was conducting a remote sensing survey ahead of the I-10 bridge construction project. And you see this cluster of shipwrecks right here. I don't know how easy it is to see from far from back. But what was found was a shipwreck that did not occur in the aerial photo. And so this is a shipwreck that, again, is about 270 feet long. Uh, those of you driving between Beaumont and Houston, you're going to pass by it every day. And ultimately what happened with this shipwreck was it was one of the vessels that was being salvaged for iron and they caught it on fire. And it's a fantastic story because the shipwreck, as it was floating downstream on fire, it hit the bridge that was brand new at the time. And it was very alarming for the community and they had firefighters on the bridge trying to put the fire out uh, so they wouldn't damage the bridge that had replaced the ferry service. And there's an extensive amount of work that's been done with this. Like, if any of you guys have ever been diving in Texas, it's zero visibility for the most part, especially in the river, and you can't see anything. But we have a kind of a, a beaming GPS system that you can attach to divers. And that archaeologist there is actually watching the progress of the divers on the riverbed. So this, these little green lines, that's a diver moving around. And so it's kind of neat, even if you can't see someone else you know, you can geo-reference the sonar image in a navigation software, and then someone else can watch what you're doing, and they can talk to you via audio and say, go this way, go that way. And it's kind of a neat way to do uh, archaeological investigations in low visibility situations. That way you don't have people looking at the same parts of the ship over and over again in a redundant way. <coughs> but this is, again, multi-beam data. This is uh, side scan sonar, and this is a it's in another acoustic device, and I, I want to say that, that there more data has been collected on this World War I archaeological site than probably any other one in the state of Texas. And while the bridge construction project was occurring, there were buoys that were placed around the wreck, and this was something that was coordinated between the TAC and TEPSOT to make sure that construction barges didn't hit uh, while the bridge was uh, being modified. So that was the first I guess, investigation of a World War I archaeological site in the Natchez River that actually identified it and found and confirmed one of these wrecks. And so when we went out this month, um, we were looking at, again, 21 reported shipwrecks from aerial photo satellite images for this portion of our project area. And um, we had 21 shipwrecks and uh, six archaeological sites. We had a cluster of nine ships in the aerial photo south of the bridge, 18 ships north of the bridge, um, and then for a total of 27. So you have 21 reported ships, but you also have additional six archaeological sites in the so, uh, so the project goals for this September were to try to validate the number of shipwrecks uh, that were there. Because again, I don't want to give something an archaeological site number based on an aerial photo from 1930 days. So we just wanted to demonstrate that they were there. See if there was anything new. Um, and again, assign site numbers. And these were the main clusters that we were interested in from the 1938 aerial. And these are going to just to kind of blow up you know, what that looks like. There's a kind of nice stack along the riverbank. So this is our cute little research vessel, Anomaly 2. You know, so again, the project area was about, I don't know, the first one was Anomaly 1, Anomaly 2. Uh, yeah, about a little over five mile uh, survey area. And again, it was just acoustic data collection and photographic documentation. And I borrowed. Uh, Sam Queller, who's a uh, a and doctoral candidate and then an intern from Texas State University. So this is kind of what they look like now. And at the end of the day, when the water level was a little lower, you could see more of these. Uh, this is one of the ones on the south side of the bridge. We actually couldn't get to those because of the sandbar. And 
that, that's the concrete that I was showing you on the earlier ships that were uh, about the morning. So there wasn't a whole lot above the water line in the view. And this is just a kind of a close up of the satellite, a close up of the 38 aerial, two of them. You know, here's our little shipwreck icon we placed there. And th this is real preliminary. I was literally getting this data last night and adding that last night and this morning. So you can see the two wrecks right there. And this, these are, again, low-resolution screen captures. And these are ESC vessels, these are barges. Um, and I'm just kind of equating our target numbers to our TAC numbers. Uh, that barge we didn't know about before the survey. So that's one of the new ones <coughs> on the lower left. And then these are higher-resolution screen captures, three of them. And then the one on the far left is the one that's at the base of the bridge, which is 410R90. And so this is comparing the 2019 data to the 2006 data. So this is just a much, much higher resolution sonar. So all in all, we confirmed the 18 vessels that were on the north side of the bridge. We discovered three or four new shipwrecks, two of which are these EFC vessels. And, but we were not able to look at the ones on the south side of the bridge. There were at least two of them we could see above the water line. And then I'm just going to real quickly show you some of the ones that are outside of your region. Um, we have two that are around Aranda's Pass. So one of them is right here. And this one I find to be kind of a compelling shipwreck because it was observed by a payout sailor in 2006. That's a fishing boat. That's a wreck right there. And I do a lot of diving in Texas, or at least when I did a lot of diving in Texas, you don't really see this kind of visibility. Um, and it's actually right next to a torpedo World War II shipwreck named John Worthington. And this was identified by Noah Dyer back in the day as a barge, but the director, uh, the former director of the Texas Maritime Museum in Rockport has seen video. He thinks it's one of these DFC vessels that was built out of Rockport. Uh, we dived on it in 2006, and you know, so this had a, a firebox and a boiler, you know, and that's not something that you would typically see on a barge. I think it was just, misidentified, but the, the brick is <coughs> consistent with that time period, and the dimensions aren't that bad. That's about 240 feet, and usually the preserved lengths of those Ferris class vessels are about 260, 270 feet. Uh, the Utena is the only one of these emergency fleet corporation vessels that sank in Texas. It was actually sank during its active life. It had been converted to a barge, but then sank when it was being towed, and it's just um, we're just right outside the channel of Aransas Pass. And then we have some concrete ships. And um, Selma's the most famous of the concrete ships. It was one of the two largest concrete vessels in the world at the time it was built. Um, like you guys know, like, like I should know about this, because you can see it from Seymour Park. Um, but uh, it struck the Campico Bar on its maiden voyage, and it was brought to Galveston, and they were unable to repair it. And so they just sort of dug a trench, and then just sank it off of Pelican Island. And the thing that's interesting was when I worked on a project and looked at this and we were geo-referencing maps, where they dug the trench is very near where the submerged uh, Civil War encampment at Pelican Island was. Like, they, I don't think they knew it, but they almost decimated a Civil War site trying to dig a hole to this. But uh, there's a really neat article I read once about how um, during the Prohibition, the liquor was taken out and then broken up on, on Selma. But there's two other concrete wellback tankers that are uh, that were made at Fort Aransas that are also at Galveston. So there's at least three of these concrete shipwrecks. And again, I know I eat into I think violent night. Sometimes I, I, I take it long, so I apologize. But there's a lot of resource material for this. Um, there's archaeological reports, mm -hmm. and some of us have sensitive information, uh, so we can't provide those. But if you are interested, there are public articles on these wrecks that we can provide. But if you review the blog that covers um, some of the earlier work that was done, and I might create a new one for the work that was just completed, and the, the final results for the September work are going to be presented by my colleague Sam at the Society for Historic Archaeology Conference this January in Boston. So, um, that is it. Thank you.
section. Um, and some of you have already seen what uh, I've laid out on the table over there. If you haven't, I'll go ahead and just draw your attention to it now. Um, as an agency, um, and I was very involved in this, uh, we produced several items for the World War I Centennial, uh, which sadly has just come to an end. But we're still in 2019. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles was only a few months ago, so uh, I'm still counting us, uh, this as a centennial year. Uh, but please do help yourself to we have copies of our quarterly magazine. We did two World War I themed issues. Uh, we also did a World War I themed travel guide for Texas slash brochure. Um, and I think I might have brought it up, I hope I did, uh, but if you were interested, please come see me. I have brought a world's official State of Texas World War I Centennial coin for you, so please do come see me and I will hook you up with that. Um, we do have one major project that I'm still working on, um, with help, of course, within the agency. Um, and that's the manuscript on Texas in the Great War. Uh, so what you're going to see today from me um, is a combination of, of uh, research that I'm, I'm still working on. Uh, so I've got, uh, if suddenly I slide into a bit of written prose, you're my guinea pigs and that's, that's from the manuscript. Uh, but I won't do that too often. Um, so, I'm going to state the obvious here and just point out that the U.S. entry into World War I on April 6, 1917 was a pivotal moment for its roughly 100 million inhabitants. Um, and I think this is especially true of young American men. And I've included this image on the right uh, because to me it kind of encapsulates uh, what I think the standard narrative is uh, that the American government wants to um, wants to push on, on young men. If you can't make it out, uh, the individual on the right, uh, he's carrying a bag that says 1917 graduate, um, and under his arm he's got um, something labeled as diploma. So the idea is that he's fresh-faced um, and the war has come, so what are his choices? Um, and this image is called Many Roads to Opportunity. It was published in the Washington Evening Star on June 15, 19. Uh, so this was not very long after uh, the U.S. enters the war, um, and I'm going to come back to why June uh, is particularly significant. Um, but if you can't make out the paths that are spread out before him, uh, the first one is Army and Navy, the second one is shipyards, the third one is uh, munitions factory, and then you've got farm and hospital service. And I love this because they all go off in this kind of idyllic farm landscape, not you know the hellscape that we know um, the Western Front uh, was. Um, so what I think is particularly noteworthy about this, I think, um, is that it emphasizes this idea that um, there is choice. And I'm going to come back to that, that theme. Um, the main talk that I have for you today is going to concentrate on shipyards, and kind of more broadly, not just the shipyards of Southeast Texas, uh, but also um, the, the port aspect as well. So if you'll forgive me, I have a little bit of, of, of prose for you just to kind of lay the scene of Southeast Texas at the turn of the century, um, and why it was such a special place um, that comes with special problems when the U.S. enters the war. So the discovery of oil at Spindletop in 1901, combined with an ongoing timber industry and expanding rice fields, had already brought unprecedented growth to Southeast Texas. By 1917, Jefferson County had more than doubled its population since the 1910 census, and the region boasted well over 100,000 inhabitants. In 1907, the Beaumont, Sour Lake, and Western Railway had connected the region and its goods to Houston, and the following year, the Sabine Natchez Canal provided an outlet to the sea. This achievement was perhaps topped eight years later in 1916, when the Port of Beaumont officially opened. The combined effect was dramatic. Between 1889 and 1909, manufacturing in the region had increased almost 300%, and fortunes had been made. Arguably, timber remained the most important commodity in the region, 
although not without its share of challenges. At the turn of the century, the Texas timber market was dominated by a small number of individual owners, families like the Stark, Starks, who owned more than half the timber firms in the state. Although the outbreak of war in Europe in 1914 had seriously curtailed exports and therefore profits, this trend was beginning to reverse by 1915. By the end of the war, three years later, timber prices had nearly doubled and roughly 23,000 men would be drawn into the sawmills and processing plants of East Texas. American entry into war on April 6, 1917 transformed the Lone Star State. Mobilization and the economic promise it held was an especially exciting prospect. Southeast Texas had good reason to be hopeful for lucrative war contracts, and as my colleague Amy already told you, they got those contracts. Just six weeks after the U.S. entered the war, a visiting government delegation on a tour of inspection was welcomed by area dignitaries. The chairman of the Federal Lumber Trade Commission, John R. Walker, summed up their impressions in glowing terms. Quote, Beaumont is simply a revelation to us. Your harbor, the waterway, the fine modern docks, the facilities for loading and unloading boats, the big industries, and probably most of all, the shipbuilding. Why, we did not know you had these things. As for the lumber, your fame spread long before we ever thought of coming here. But the other things I've mentioned, they are new and should be heralded more. Um, and I would argue that uh, Texas politicians at the local, state, and national level during World War I were exceptionally good at bringing the pork home. Um, they made some very good points about the state. It had suitable climate for training facilities, especially for aviation. Uh, but what often gets overlooked is that uh, the shipbuilding uh, folks were working just as hard as the folks that brought Camp Logan and these other facilities to, to Texas. Within months, nine shipyards along the Texas Gulf Coast received contracts to build wooden steamships for the U.S. Shipping Board. Most of the shipyards were concentrated in the Orange and Beaumont area, the epicenter of ship construction in Texas. 35 ships were under contract in Orange alone. The National Shipbuilding Company would eventually build at least two what were likely the longest wooden ships built at that time, made of southern yellow pine, they were 330 feet in length with a tonnage of 5,000 tons. Uh, and my uh, colleague Amy has already highlighted some of the issues that happened um, as a result of this uh, speedy, uh, this haste to get these ships produced. British Prime, I'll end on this. British Prime Minister Lloyd George had famously demanded ships, more ships, and more ships, and the US, particularly Texas, had answered the call. Um, and I just like these two images, particularly <laughs> on the right, uh, because I think that they visually emphasize uh, what we've been saying about this part of the state and shipbuilding. Um, on the left, uh, this was an advertisement that was put out uh, during the war. Uh, if you can't read it, it says, to lumbermen, for the support of our soldiers in France, the government must have wooden ships. Without ships, the war cannot be won. Without timber ships, uh, without timber, ships cannot be built. Our country looks to you. Every swing of an axe, every cut of a saw, may score as heavily as a shot fired from the trenches. Help our boys and friends. With them, uh, with them, win the war. Make the world safe for democracy. Um, and I think this is a really interesting civilian counterbalance to what I've seen with recruitment of the 20th Engineer, the Forestry Regiment. Uh, and these were um, by and large, but not exclusively so, men that had some kind of lumber background, uh, particularly from the Pacific Northwest, um, the uh, southeastern part of the United States, uh, Georgia Pine, for example, um, and also from my own research, um, men were heavily recruited from uh, the eastern part of this state to go into the forestry regiment. Now again, that's a military service that was in the U.S. Army, what I'm arguing here is that uh, equal attention is being paid to enticing civilians, uh, men, particularly men with a timber background, to go into shipbuilding. This is an honorable profession, an honorable way to serve, just as much as if you had a gun and you were in the trenches. And I love this image on the right. 
This is from March 25th, 1918, uh, and it's called The Big Spring Drive. Um, and again, you've got Uncle Sam here, um, and he's shouting, speed up the ships, spade up the soil. Um, and underneath him, you can see um, reminders, specifications for ships, plans for planting, of course, planting trees, but also more, uh, more broadly agricultural. Uh, if you remember, one of those paths that a young man graduate could have chosen uh, was uh, farm, farm work. And of course, buy bonds, because the US government was always looking to finance this war. Um, and a particularly lovely detail, if you notice in the back with the ships, um, a nice little nod there uh, with a teddy bear to Teddy Roosevelt, the former president, um, who was instrumental in uh, basically turbocharging our, our US Navy at the turn of the century. I also like to think of it as a nice little nod to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's post-war influence in the preparedness movement. Uh, because you know we hear a lot about sort of isolationism, and it's true. Many Americans prior to entry in this war did not want to go to war, but there was a very vocal element, and Teddy Roosevelt was former President Teddy Roosevelt was probably its most uh, visible spokesperson uh, who did want to enter this war and war to the point were very active in 1914, 15, 16 uh, in, in preparing. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that point uh, a little bit later. Um, and I just included these because, again, visually, I think they very much represent um, this idea that the U.S. government wants to put forward um, of, of stressing inclusion. Inclusion, even if, even if you are just a civilian and you're not actually going over and fighting. Uh, but there is something patriotic and honorable and that you were included almost symbolically in this U.S. Army, if you like. Um, and they do this very well with the imagery, um, particularly, I think, the one on the far left, Together We Win. And you can see that the, uh, um, he, I assume he's a shipbuilder because you can see ship in the background, and you can see again the, uh, the framing there. And he's flanked on either side by uh, an American sailor and American um, soldier. So this idea that we're all in this together, even if uh, you're a civilian. Uh, teamwork wins, uh, all the job for victory, make every minute count for purging. Uh, this idea, again, of, of uh, visually stressing uh, inclusion. So the sense of urgency for shipbuilding, I think, comes down to two factors. Uh, the first was that the war in Europe in 1914, because again, remember, we don't enter this war until April of 1917, um, had created a real shipping crisis uh, for American international trade. So at this time, the U.S. merchant marine was the second largest in the world, after Britain, um, in terms of gross tonnage. But less than one-fifth of that was in international trade. Pre-war U.S. exporters were relying primarily on British ships to move their goods. So even before the war, we had a, a real dependency and a real lack of um, investment in our own uh, international merchant marine. And there are a lot of reasons for that that I can talk about later if you're interested. But, um, uh, so we were already depending on Britain. Once Britain enters this war in 1914, that furthers the crisis. Um, and of course, the crisis then deepens by the policy, the German policy of unrestricted submarine warfare, uh, which devastated Britain's merchant fleet. Um, in fact, there's an excellent website. I would have put the URL up, but it's wonky and really long and not user friendly. Um, but it's, uh, the website is the Smithsonian Magazine, and it's interactive. And you can click on which year of the war. So let's say for argument's sake, you go to um, 1915, you click on that, you can zoom in all over the Atlantic into the Mediterranean and it actually shows each ship sunk is a colored dot and it's colored by type. So um, orange is merchant, you've got I think red is um, uh, uh, military, 
Um, and all you see is just a sea of dots. If you click on a dot, it actually tells you the name of the ship, the tonnage, loss of life, and, and whatever. And I highly recommend this when I uh, talk with teachers because it hits you in the face when you're looking at this and you're zooming in and clicking on it, um, that the allies were just bleeding ships, absolutely bleeding ships. Um, and of course, that was the, the ace in the hole for the German uh, government, is they would be blockaded by the British and they knew that the only chance that they had was to possibly starve the British and French into submission through this, uh, through unrestricted submarine warfare. Um, and again, the U.S. government uh, doesn't miss an opportunity to visually bring this point home. Um, and I mentioned the preparedness movement. Uh, sort of one of my bugbears is when, when people say, oh, we entered this war because of the sinking of the Lusitania. It's like, no, the Lusitania goes down in 1915. Um, and interestingly, we don't, of course, we don't enter the war in 2017. <coughs> but this poster created by Fred Spear um, actually uh, depicts a, uh, a fanciful recreation of, of one of the female victims of the Lusitania disaster, holding her baby, sinking the bottom of, uh, of the sea, of the Atlantic. Um, and this was an attempt by the American government in 1915, and we're two years away from entering this war, to try and get American men to enlist in the US Navy by using this strategy. So although the Lusitania doesn't get us in the war, we do recognize its potential to uh, kind of beef up our military, which, uh, which we're doing even before we get into this war. Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much about this because uh, Amy already covered it very extensively, but uh, I'll just briefly mention that the United States Shipping Board, which is overseeing a lot of this uh, shipbuilding, uh, was organized on January 30th, 1917, so a few months before we entered the war. Although the act that gave it the, the power to do so uh, was from September 7th, 1916. Uh, the board, the United States Shipping Board, seized, requisitioned, or purchased vessels as well as began a program of shipbuilding, um, and it did this primarily through the Emergency Fleet Corporation. Um, just to kind of recap, by November 1917, 35 ships are under construction in Orange. Beaumont had four yards building uh, a wooden steamship. McBride and Law, Lone Star Shipbuilding Company, Beaumont Shipbuilding and Dry Dock, Dry Dock Company, um, and J.N. McCannon. Um, so you really have this hub of activity going on. So I've come back to this image of the choice. And one thing that I do want to again stress here is that the image itself pushed on American men in 1917 implies choice and option. It does not allow for not choosing. But in reality, many men of all nationalities had varying degrees of willingness to participate in the war efforts. Um, and the reality is this war was incredibly divisive and very unpopular. That's something we don't really talk about with this war. If I said the Vietnam conflict, I'm assuming that one of the things that comes to your mind is protest. Um, you know, the, the, the pushback, the, uh, the, the protesting, this idea that over time, Americans significantly began to have a hostile feeling about involvement in the Vietnam conflict. In many ways, something similar is happening with World War I, but it was not quite as obvious to the observer, and there are some reasons why that I'd like to talk about. Um, how do we measure the unpopularity of a war like this? Well, one way that we can do it is through legislation that gets passed, um, particularly federal and state governments. What are they, what are they passing over? So I've got a small selection of acts that I think tell us a little bit about the mindset of Americans, and I'm going to take a deep dive on some of these. The first one is the Selective Service Act. So when the U.S. entered the First World War, it had no more than at most 300,000 in its military forces. Um, by the end of this war, it will have 4 point, roughly 4.7 million uh, men and women in uniform. Um, I, when we entered this 
before we immediately passed the selective service because we realized that pushing individuals, pushing American men to select volunteering for this war is not working. It will not get us the numbers that we need. So we passed this legislation within a month of us entering the war. Only, well, not even 100,000 American men had volunteered for military service when we entered uh, within the month. So what does the Selective Service Act require? Well, it required all men between the ages of 21 and 30 to register for the draft with their local draft board. And the first draft date was set for June 5th, 1917. And by the end of that war, 24 million American men had registered. Um, now, with a draft comes evasion. We never really talk about desertion or draft evasion when it comes to World War I. Um, and I like to point this out, even as a native Texan, just because I'm a little contrary and subversive, Texas had a 13% desertion rate in World War I, the same as New York. <laughs> so, now there, there's, in fact, if you're really interested in this topic, there's an excellent book on it, Jeanette Keith, uh, Rich Man's War, Poor Man's Fight. And she actually gets into uh, uh, the breakdown of class, socioeconomic class, and race. Um, and particularly in the South, uh, this wasn't uniformly unpopular as a war. Uh, no surprise, different parts of the country had uh, stronger or, or fewer um, uh, strong feelings about uh, involvement. Uh, I just want, I want to say a quick aside on the topic of numbers. Uh, I mentioned that we went from 300,000 to 4.7 million. Um, on the first day of the song, uh, the song, I'm pretty sure that the British lost about 25, 26,000 men in casualties. Now that includes uh, dead, wounded, missing, taken prisoner. Uh, so kind of wrap your head around that, 25,000 in one day. Uh, so when the US enters this war and says, hey, our 300,000 are, are yours, uh, the, the British and the French um, quickly realize that that's, that's not going to cut it. The Espionage Act coincides with the rollout for selective service. I mentioned June 5th was the first uh, registration date. Um, the Espionage Act was passed in June of 1917. Uh, and effectively, or essentially, it is a crackdown on anti-war dissent. It is a measure to ensure that the men that you are requiring to register for selected service do it. But it goes much further than that. This piece of legislation was aimed at labor activists, pacifists, and socialists, as well as groups that showed hostility to or mixed feelings about the war. So there were lots of individuals, or groups I should say, within the United States that on the <coughs> had mixed feelings about this war. African Americans, you have President Wilson saying, make the world safe for democracy, and they say, well, hold up, we don't have it here. Um, Irish Americans. <coughs> the Easter Uprising happens in 1916. You have a civil war in Ireland. The Irish basically see World War I as an opportunity to, um, to fight back against uh, what they see as British oppressors. Uh, obviously, German Americans. You have all kinds of constituent groups within the United States legitimately have mixed feelings and even hostile feelings to the U.S. in the war. And I like to remind people that up until April 1917, we weren't officially declared on this war. And so you could say all the, <laughs> you could express uh, whatever you wanted about Britain being wrong, President Wilson being an idiot. As of June of 1917, you cannot. What are some of the things the Espionage and then later the Sedition Act, which amends, makes worse, <laughs> the Espionage Act? What are some things that could get you in trouble? Insulting the US government, the flag, the military, or the Constitution? Criticizing the war effort? Um, interfering with recruitment or mobilization? Displaying the flag of an enemy nation? By word or act, this is a quote, by word or act, support or favor the cause of any country with which the U.S. is at war. If you express sympathy for German civilians starving, this can be construed as a violation of the Espionage Act. Ad 
advocating or defending any of the above. You don't have to do it. You could just defend someone else's right to display a human flag. It also allowed both the Espionage and Sedition Acts, the U.S. Postal Service. It becomes a powerful agency during this war. Um, and the Postmaster General is a Texan, uh, as, a, as an aside. Uh, it allowed the U.S. Postal Service to block delivery of mail to organizations or individuals it deemed subversive or unpatriotic, and that includes um, periodicals and newspapers. Um, many of the latter had to shut down. So if you had an arrangement with uh, the uh, post office department, as it was called then, uh, to send your labor organization newsletter, and you had third class mailing rates, or second class, which saved a substantial amount of money, um, they could then turn around and say, actually, you have to pay first class rates. Or they could deny you the right to, as an organization, to mail uh, at all. Uh, so this was a targeted way of clamping down on organizations uh, that the, basically the U.S. government did not like. Um, later in the war, we have one in 1917, but particularly in 1918, which again, much like the Sedition Act, strengthened the law that came uh, the previous year. Um, the U.S. government revises its immigration laws in these two pieces of legislation, um, in part to crack down on aliens uh, as the term was known then, uh, residing in the country. Uh, the U.S. government is particularly going after anarchists, uh, broadly defined, uh, but others were deported during this period for World War I specific activities. What do I mean by World War I specific activity? Well, uh, let's say in 1917 you criticized the U.S. going to war. Let's say you were like the famous socialist Emma Goldman, you've been in the country for decades, uh, very vocal in 1917 about uh, or criticizing the war effort, criticizing U.S. entry into the war. Uh, the U.S. government uses the New Immigration Act to deport her and hundreds of other foreign nationals, many of whom have been residing, as I mentioned, uh, for decades. Uh, you also see some, oh, some legislation at the state level uh, and I just pulled these two because I thought it'd be particularly interesting. Um, what starts off as House Bill 13 prohibited the sale of intoxicating spirits to members of the U.S. military. Uh, and going through, when I was doing my research, I saw many Houston prosecutions, the, the lure of Ellington Field and Camp Logan and uh, all those uh, uh, places. Um, you could be incarcerated for serving a man in uniform, an intoxicating beverage, for no less than two years and no more than five years. And each violation is a separate offense. <coughs> um, House Bill 15 dedicated, or sorry, duplicated much of the language of the Espionage Act. Um, it did single out language or actions, quote, calculated to provoke a breach of the peace. Um, so think about how broadly that is worded. Uh, anybody that, and, and I've actually come across uh, one, one example in particular that stood out to me. Uh, the guy was arrested uh, in East Texas for saying President Wilson is an idiot. <laughs> now how many times have, have we called a president of the United States an idiot in our lifetimes? Um, that under the Espionage Act could get you arrested and in jail. Um, it made desecration or even casting contempt on the U.S. flag a state felony. The penalty was no less than two years, no more than 25 years of incarceration. It also empowered county district courts to prosecute. It authorized any officer to arrest violators without a warrant and to use force if necessary. And it required those who knew of violations to report. So think about that. Texas legislators in 1918, so it's a special session, they're, they're in the law here, um, felt so strongly about having that extra hammer that they passed legislation um, to, to sock up, if you will, anybody that couldn't be caught using uh, a federal law. Um, and I love this picture. I'm sorry that it's a bit kind of uh, fuzzy there, but uh, you've got this snake and it says sedition bills. Um, and then you've got 
these, these three individuals over here who are kind of one's got a stick and he's trying to fight back and the others are cowering. And the three names are honest opinion, free speech, and free press. Um, and these two pieces of legislation had a chilling effect on all three. Um, so it is very difficult to measure um, uh, resistance to this war because you you can't do it in the conventional ways. You can still do it, and I'll show you one major way that, that I did it, and you can do it. Um, but it's much harder because people don't necessarily want to share their true thoughts during this war. Can I interrupt uh, for a second? Yeah. Um, if anyone far from front of Tarascos, they have to load some trucks. So Tarascos is just right to the left of us, so you can park in that first line. Um, they're just asking you to move your cars. But it's not you. Ignore this. It's terrible if it was me. <laughs> and, uh, so this legislation was in part a tacit recognition by the federal and state governments that large segments of its populations were ambivalent about the war at best and downright hostile at worst. In particular, a deep-rooted distrust of war profiteering existed in many sectors of the American public. The words rich man's war, poor man's fight were uttered by many Americans who, for various ethnic, national, or socioeconomic reasons, were suspicious of the nation's motives for entering the war. There was good reason for this. One in five Americans was either an immigrant or a child of immigrants, and it was not uncommon for feelings for or against combatant nations to run deep. Uh, I think it was something like 44 uh, languages were uh, recognized by the U.S. military during training. <coughs> this was less of an issue for, um, well, I don't know, actually, I probably should say this, um, especially since Logan and, and other places got men from uh, all over the country. Um, but Texas, uh, you know, someplace like New York, for example, or um, Chicago, where you had uh, even more diverse ethnic groups. Uh, than in Texas. Um, so you had serious problems with literacy um, and also um, it further distrust on the part of the government when you had all these different uh, language groups and the sense of kind of other. Uh, for millions of laboring underclass in the United States, views on the conflict were further exacerbated by ongoing progressive attempts to reform the worst excesses Capitalism. We are deep in the progressive era, if you remember your, uh, your, your high school history. Uh, these included dangerous work with few protections, long hours, and often substandard pay. For those who toiled in industries with company towns, like shipbuilding, <laughs> added burdens included workers being forced to shop in company stores for food and clothing, or being made to use company tokens or credit instead of cash. And that's Particularly problematic with the lumber uh, lumber mills, particularly in sort of the. I'm from East Texas, so I'm, I'm fairly comfortable saying deep in the backwoods of 1918 uh, East Texas. Um, you didn't have a lot of choices. Corporate spies, employment associations, and local police discouraged, sometimes violently, attempts to unionize or collectively bargain. Um, and I included these photos because I just think, again, they reinforce visually uh, what the United States government feels it is dealing with uh, during 1918 and then going forward uh, post-war as well. On the left, you've got the world's melting pot. That's one of those, um, uh, you know, depending on your, your level of cynicism, it, it's either a, a lovely ideal or it's either a, um, a cliche, uh, the term melting pot. Uh, but it was known to Americans even in 1918. Uh, this one is titled, We Can't Digest the Scum. And Uncle Sam is staring into the melting pot. Um, and what's in there is kind of roughly in the shape of uh, the US. Um, and in the mix is uh, Bolshevism, the mad notions of Europe, I like that one. <laughs> Un-American ideals, anarchy, IWW, and the red flag. Talk about the IWW in just a moment. And the middle one, we've got Uncle Sam again outside of uh, the Capitol building, and the flag waving in front of it says Sedition Law Passed. Well, that would be the Sedition Act of uh, May 1918. Um, and you've got Uncle Sam corralling uh, a group of, of the individuals here. And the title of this one is Now for a Roundup. And on the bottom left, you have an IWW. 
which is the Industrial Workers of the World, or the Wobblies, IWW, uh, which was a labor organization founded in 1905, and it was the only labor organization to, um, to remain active during this period that opposed U.S. involvement in the war. So their, their leadership was particularly gutted in terms of, of um, arrests and prosecutions. Um, and you can see here, you've got this individual uh, made fat from, I guess, prosperity, and it says traitor. Uh, you've also got spy, and you can't see the guy holding the bomb here, it says Sinn Féin. So their idea was, well, if you're Irish during this period, then uh, you're clearly an, an anarchist. And on the right, again, IWW, and what I find particularly uh, prominent about this is, I mean, they're making there's, there's no way to miss what they're communicating here. They're basically saying, if you are a member of the IWW, if you are uh, actively trying to improve conditions during wartime uh, for the American worker, you are a German sympathizer. <coughs> and so the, Ameri the American government is very aware that it has to win hearts and minds. Um, and the primary way that it does this, at least officially, is through a new branch or a new agency that, that it creates uh, called the Committee on Public Information, or the CPI. Um, and it's essentially, it's a propaganda government agency. It, you know, really into World War II, I'm sure you've seen the World War II equivalent. Um, they, it didn't originate in World War II, it didn't originate in World War I, but, uh, you know, World War I, they particularly, um, they, it becomes much more sophisticated, particularly since you have, this is the era of film. So one of the things that they do um, is the news division, uh, the official United States war film. So, I mean, on the surface, it's meant to be journalistic, uh, but really this is a, a propaganda means to make sure that the Americans who are uh, in the film house in the evenings or on the weekends uh, are supporting the war effort. Uh, another way that you do that is through the Four Minute Men Division. It's a whole division, about 75,000 civilian volunteers. Um, and these were volunteers who, in specific social settings, would give four minute talks. And of course, the you know, cinema was a great place to do that because while they're changing reels or getting the reel ready, you've got a four minute man that jumps up and he's got his pitch that he delivers, and it's supposed to be time for four minutes. Um, and it would be on a particular topic. So a man might talk about volunteering or registering for the draft or buying war bonds or um, maintaining a victory garden. Um, and then, so this was one way that the US government tried to reach Americans and, and kind of pull them into supporting this war. Um, the Division of Pictorial Publicity, I've already shown you several examples of their handiwork. Um, in, in addition to uh, recruitment posters, also some of the cartoons and political illustrations that were in newspapers were planted there effectively by the, the government. Um, not necessarily because the newspaper, um, you know, the, the artists that they employed felt that, that way. Um, and also really interesting, I think, are the loyalty leaflets. Um, these were also produced by the CPI. And they dealt with a variety of subjects. If you can see here, there's, there are a couple of themes. One um, is that they disproportionately, I think, focus on socioeconomic class and national status. So, uh, for example, labor and the war. Uh, oops, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, this was a you know, loyalty leaflet designed to basically say, hey, we know you're concerned about working conditions and wages and things like that, but kind of step it down for a more uh, friendly words to the foreign born. Uh, we're happy to have you going to foreign. Come tone the foreigners down. Yeah. Um, so again, these are ways of the, the US government in its own way trying to, uh, to control the, the, the messaging. So this is one of my favorite examples. I love uh, Morris Wong's uh, Morris Wong, he, he's kind of a good case in point about uh, these socioeconomic and, and um, anxieties about foreign born. Um, he was a young man in his 20s. He was living in, uh, actually I can give you his exact address, 710 Milo Street in Houston. 
Um, and we have the content of several letters that he wrote in 1918. He confessed in one of his letters to a friend, quote, you ask about the draft. You know, you and I are both in class 1A. This is the first time an alien enemy has been classified as an A1 American citizen. It's not a joke in spite of possible tragic consequences. However, keep this strictly secret. When I first arrived here, I thought it would be a good chance for me to withdraw myself from the jurisdiction of Uncle Sam, but I have observed the situation very carefully, and I noticed that the dispersion of all societies and groups who have attempted to evade or defeat the draft machine, and I have come to the conclusion that it is best to practice a little camouflage and not make any open resistance. So what you see on the right is his draft registration as required by the Selective Service Act, um, and he was living in Chicago at the time. And he put down that he was natural born. <coughs> and he wrote down any exemption? Yeah, a conscientious objector. Um, and then we have this, this physical description here. Um, and the draft board was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna come to the war. Uh, and we know that he gets drafted because in February of 1918, he wrote a letter to a different friend, and this is what he wrote. I have a piece of hard luck to tell you, and that is that I'm drafted. Last Tuesday, I had to report for physical examination, and to all probabilities, I shall be accepted and certified. Therefore, I do not know how long I shall stay here, for I will either have to go into military service or skip to Mexico. <laughs> so, <coughs> he's basically foreign born. He lied and said that he was a citizen. Um, and now he's talking uh, or thinking about compounding his situation uh, by moving to Mexico. I have not decided which I shall do yet, as my funds are not sufficient for me to live in Mexico until I can find employment and settle there, as I do not understand the Spanish language. Perhaps the war will not last long enough to take all the trouble of evading the draft. He then goes on to write to a different friend, this one, a young soldier at Camp Devons, I have purchased a Liberty Bond to the amount of $50. I did this not for its patriotic or pecuniary reasons, but more for self-defense. The ownership of the bond will give me a reputation for patriotism, and it won't cost me anything. This will be especially valuable should I commit some indiscretion <laughs> in disparaging the patriotic spirit and the war cause in general. The bond will always be a good kickback against the patriotic telltales and spies and besides, it pays four and a quarter percent interest. <laughs> May as well be a wise hypocrite than a foolish patriotic ape. I did not send you my PO box on a previous letter for fear that the letter might miscarry, and I did not want to provide clues to the sender on account of some compromising statements there. He's written nothing but compromising statements in his correspondence with multiple people. Um, and I too many letters to go through, but in other letters, he encourages the recipients to avoid the draft, uh, or if already in service, like his friend, a Congress at Camp Evans, uh, don't be a hero, stay torn up the back, let others take the bullets. He commits all this to paper. Um, so he's already been violating multiple parts of the espionage. Well, what Morris does not know is that all this time, uh, he's been under surveillance. His landlady, Mrs. H. Lawler, thought, oh, there's something up with this guy, and she reported him to the Bureau of Investigation, the forerunner of our Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mrs. Lawler was, uh, she, so she begins sharing things with the, the BI. Um, she starts off by kind of snooping around his room because as his landlady, she cleans his room, um, and so she takes it upon herself to read uh, newsletters that he has, rifle through his correspondence, um, and at least one instance to take torn paper from his waste paper uh, basket and give it to the Bureau so that they can reassemble torn bits. Uh, so lying about being an American citizen uh, and his dubious draft status are only the tip of the iceberg for his problems. Um, the Bureau puts him under surveillance, uh, this lasts for uh, months. In fact, his bureau file is, uh, if memory serves, 150 pages long. 
Um, he is an organizer and lecturer for the Young People's Socialist League, and they find a card in his possession uh, that basically states the, the ideals of, of um, the organization. Uh, and I particularly love this. What we practice, comradeship, education in social science, history and literature, free discussion of all subjects of, special, of social interest, elegance in speech and deportment, interesting entertainments. <laughs> um, and perhaps equally upsetting to the Bureau um, is that they find a uh, certificate of membership in the Church of Humanity of Schenectady, New York, uh, which stated that Mr. Morris Wong of Schenectady, New York, has learned and accepted the scientific discoveries as God is a myth and Earth ends life forever and is a member of the Church of Humanity. Uh, so effectively, um, outing himself as an atheist on top of uh, being a socialist. Uh, and this is where it goes into crazy town, because on October 28, 1917, Wong's brother Otto wrote to him from Schenectady, in regard to the infernal machine, I can easily design a foolproof box such as you wish if you will send me more information regarding the dimensions of the box. Anyone know what an infernal machine is? It's a bomb. Um, an old timey word for bomb. Uh, or explosive device. Uh, later, November 11th, 1917, um, he, his brother goes on to write The cobalt nitrate, which I sent you, was addressed to your residence. Therefore, you should have received. I have not had any spare time to construct the boxes you require, but will do so this week. What you need is something that you can reopen safely by means of a certain secret adjustment, which will enable you to make any changes you might require. You may rely on me to construct the model. <coughs> I have not as yet tried the ink of which you informed me, but from experience, I find the trouble with most inks is that they leave a slightly rough surface of the paper which is visible upon the letter being held to the light. So what the two brothers are discussing stupidly in print using the US Postal Service um, is how to make an invisible ink. Um, so you've got him talking about making bone, him making um, invisible ink, uh, and at one point he even talks about knowing, his background is in chemistry, knowing how to, uh, it's probably not true, but how to make a concoction that when injected into the, the lower back mimicked paralysis so that you could get out of military service, but then the feeling would come back. I'm like, who would volunteer for this? I want to be the guinea pig, stick that in my back. Um, and I, I chose this picture because uh, it mentioned an infernal machine, it's actually from the late 19th century. Uh, and you can make out Irish here, uh, but basically this is just one big um, illustration about how barbarous and dangerous the, the Irish were. And I gotta say that not a whole lot changes between uh, the 1880s and 1918 when it comes to um, attitudes towards the Irish by um, a lot of Americans. So our friend gets arrested. He's arrested April 19, 1918. He's interrogated by bureau agents. He was held in Harris County Jail without bail. Other uh, individuals in the jail beat him up, so he had to move to solitary because even those who were in the Harris County Jail were still patriots. <laughs> That's what the jailers were, were saying in their uh, correspondence. He's convicted in the U.S. District Court in Houston of violating the Espionage Act. Um, specifically, here's where it gets interesting, I think. He, um, he's convicted of willfully attempting to cause insubordination, disloyalty, mutiny, and refusal of duty, um, and obstructing the recru recruiting and enlistment service of the United States. So they basically find him guilty of telling his friend at Camp Devons, eh, don't. Uh, that's what they got him on. So that tells me that the other stuff maybe they didn't take seriously. Um, you know. But he's sentenced to 15 months. Um, and he begins that sentence in <coughs> November um, 1918 at the U.S. Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia, and by a sort of weird stroke of, of um, um, it's also, his sentence overlaps with uh, Eugene B. Debs, uh, the famous socialist who I told you about, um, I think it was 10 years um, for speaking out against the war. Uh, they're both sent to, to this particular one. 
Um, on a side note, uh, I received his paperwork from uh, the National Archives and Records Administration at Atlanta, and his prison records are kind of crazy town because uh, there's some information in there from June of 1941. He was not in prison in 1941, uh, but the prison was contacted by FBI Newark, New Jersey field office. Um, and they wanted to know about his time 20 years before at the prison because he was doing essential war work for World War II. <laughs> and they were like, mm, should we keep him on this essential war work or maybe not? Um, so, um, anyway. so cases like uh, Morris Wong's uh, were possible because you had nosy blind ladies that just thought something was off. Uh, and I'm just going to take it upon myself to go through his stuff and then bring in uh, the bureau. But it was also possible uh, because of the American Protective League. And this is a essentially an auxiliary civilian group of volunteers that supported the bureau. And at its height, uh, there were 250,000 individuals across the U.S. Uh, their main goal essentially was to spy. They spied on their neighbors, their war colleagues, their family. Uh, they snooped through mail and telegrams. They participated in raids on suspected draft evaders. Um, and at their worst, operatives could act as vigilantes and actually assault. Uh, they had a bi-monthly newsletter. I've included one image there. Um, the newsletter carried articles on how to conduct yourself as an operative. Uh, you had a little badge that you were supposed to show only for work-related um, it, it, moments, and in fact, you were actually restricted from telling people that you were in the APL. So it's effectively, it's a secret organization if you belong to it. Um, and here's what the application for enrollment looks like. Uh, this is pulled from Ancestry. Oh, right. Ancestry, if you ever go around there. Um, and this is John Matthew Conley, uh, Beaumont, Texas. His present position is listed as a lawyer. Um, and basically, they ask him things like, do you use any intoxicating liquors? And he says, eh, mildly. <laughs> um, are you married? Yes. What foreign languages do you speak? Uh, what clubs or organizations do you belong to? Uh, in his case, the Elks and I love this, et cetera. Like, uh, fill in the blank there. Um, and then on the back, here was the oath that you were required. Um, and one of the one of the oaths, parts of the oath were, I will not accept in the necessary performance of my duty, exhibit my credentials, or disclose my membership in the organization, and that I will not disclose to any person other than a duly authorized government official um, facts about you know what you um, at the time. And, and I have to stress again, the SBA contract was really poorly defined. It was very uh, very broadly defined, and so. Individuals like this were given a great deal of power um, and discretion. So I'm going to end on some strike information. Uh, one of the most feared activities were strikes. I mean, yes, you had infirm machine makers and people trying to talk people out of um, registering for the draft or volunteering. These were concerns of the government. But one major, major concern was strike activity. Um, and one of the most important strikes happens during this period in Orange, uh, over 10 days. Saturday, January 12th, in a shipyard, the laborers go on strike. Their union demands a minimum of 40 cents per hour. Um, one of the complaints that the strikers have is that the locals in Orange, and it's, this is echoed in places like Beaumont, uh, is that locals are gouging them on necessities. Uh, and in particular, landlords, that landlords um, jacked the rent up since uh, the shipyards went into activity. So, for example, several people reported that uh, within a year, their rent had gone up 100%. Um, and at one point, uh, when the U.S. government uh, finally negotiates a raise, uh, the landlords uh, raise their rents the exact same amount that uh, the government negotiated the increase in pay. Uh, so in some cases, it, it does appear that the strikers have very legitimate um, complaints. Um, 
What's interesting during the strike period, like I said, it only lasts about 10 days, um, is that uh, the shipbuilders essentially throw the problem to the federal government. Instead of actually sitting down with the union uh, reps, they say, hey, why don't you stay on the job and we will bring in um, the federal government as sort of our, you know, arbitrators um, and we'll see if we can come to some sort of agreement. And what many of the strikers don't realize or don't know is that during this entire 10-day uh, event, uh, the Bureau and the CPA are actively infiltrating. Uh, they're going into the saloons of Orange and Beaumont. They're actually um, essentially spying and taking notes of who the quote-unquote agitators were. Um, just to sweeten the deal, the U.S. government sends in some soldiers just to kind of be a visual presence while this is all going on. Um, and in fact, Bureau report on this incident does note that in their opinion, the presence of U.S. soldiers during the strike in the town of Orange perhaps guilted the strikers, either guilted them or intimidated them into acquiescing and going back to work. Um, and I'll note that a lot of the reports make note of uh, the level of alcohol consumption. They're very concerned about the strikers. Uh, that comes up very, very frequently. Um, and just in case I've presented too sympathetic uh, a portrait of the strikers, there's this little lovely bit from uh, March of 1918. So this is uh, two months after that other strike. Um, 22 caulkers employed at Beaumont Ship building and dry dock company walk out on the job. Their pains to stress that the strike was not due to complaints about wages or work conditions. It is because the company employed African-American oakum spinners. And the strikers emphasized that uh, the work should have gone to white men or women instead. Um, so again, you've got the color line uh, complicating a lot of the socioeconomic um, stresses as well. Um, and rounding out our strike problem, we also have uh, the fact that the U.S. government is very concerned about um, Chinese and enemy aliens, particularly German enemy aliens. Uh, this is from the Spyglass, uh, again, it's a bi-monthly newsletter. Um, and this is, uh, every now and then they would have uh, basically like Mug shots. <laughs> Have you seen this enemy alien? He didn't register, um, not for the draft, but enemy aliens were required to register uh, at their local post office. Uh, and some of these individuals that come up in the records, the bureau records that I looked at, were employed at Orange and Beaumont shipyards. Um, and this created a huge nightmare because the bureau wanted these men out um, because, you know, they. A cigar was not a cigar, it was a, you know, it was a saboteur and a, um, a German agent, whereas the ship builders and ship owners, uh, the companies, wanted to retain those men because in most cases they were highly skilled engineers and they were, were needed. And at least in one case, uh, one individual who was at the, um, um, I think it's one of the Beaumont shipyards, uh, was actually arrested and was interned. We did have internment camps during World War I, uh, at least three, and he was held at Fort Oglethorpe in Georgia. Um, and if anyone's interested in learning more about Fort Oglethorpe, I have um, a copy with me that I brought today where um, another German American, or in this case, German American individual was interned at Fort Oglethorpe and he kept a diary during his internment, so it's fascinating to me. Um, but, I guess I'll just conclude here that um, I think this, these types of topics are very important because it's essential that we know what mobilization was like and the training process and what did, uh, what did these individuals that uh, were caught up in the war go through and how did they support the war. But equally, we need to know what's under the rock. You know? uh, stories like this remind us that uh, the war is a messy business, and we don't have monolithic reactions to it as a people and as a country. Um, and so, it's a fascinating topic, and thank you very much.
You mentioned that the state of Texas passed a number of laws during World War I against sedition. Are any of them still on the books? So, are they, in our, I can't, I can't, are they in our Constitution? I can't comment on the Texas laws, but I can say